Hey, what's up? I just wanted to knock out a couple of things, a couple of quick things about programming in general. So I just got off the phone with a friend of mine and he was talking about how he likes to basically be an artist. That's literally, that's what he was saying. That's what he likes to do. He likes to create art and that's totally understandable. And for a lot of people, I would say maybe even most of us, that's programming is a means to an end. If nothing else, it probably at least started out that way. You want to make video games or something like that. Um, for some people, I think it's also like a giant calculator and a giant crossword puzzle. Some blend of those types of things. And for others, it, it becomes that. For some of the people in the first category, I think they become the second crowd. That's how I would define myself. I originally just wanted to make flashy graphics and make this little mechanical device be more more flashy and whatever. And it's also like a virtual sandbox in that sense too. But anyway, then I eventually, after starting to try and fail and little small successes at doing that, I finally realized, you know, there's, we don't have this all right, or very few of us have it mostly right, even, and I mean very, very, very few people have it mostly right. I would like to think I'm becoming one of those people, um, but there's just, and the funny thing is, is it's like, in the end, it's, it's so simple, I think, like, once you can wrap your head around all the BS and spin the plates and think about it, like manage your cognitive load, balance all that, everything's pretty simple, like everything that seems to work, but people overcomplicate it and, or they'll just have some misunderstanding, especially like terminology. That is the biggest trip up alone. I would say like 51 plus percent of all issues that seem huge or something with software engineering type of related issues are just a simple trip up on terminology. And that trip up can happen in one of many or maybe even many of many different ways. But, um, you know, it could be something as simple like if somebody says floating point. I'm going to talk about a floating point number, then right away in your head you might already think like, well, what, <laughs> you could just come from so many different angles that could trip so many different people up. It's like some people don't even know what a floating point number is. Some people have some understanding of a floating point number. Some people think they have some understanding of floating point numbers. Um, and some people might think they already, whatever, they might think single precision, double precision, like, oh, which one are you talking about? Or they might have just jumped in their head to one precision or another. Um, there's all sorts of stuff around that, that, you know, just that one term right there is an example and all sorts of stuff I haven't even mentioned about it. So it's just, or if I say integrated development environment, like, what does that mean? It can mean more than one thing or, you know, somebody else might picture something. This is an integrated development environment right here, right in front of me. So I don't know if that like jolts anybody where they're like, whoa, that, you know, or if it's like, oh yeah, that's totally obvious. But anyway, um, my point of all that rambling, the, one of the main points is that it's really, it's simple. Um, there's some simple principles out there and 
there's not many of them and people make huge careers out of turning them into complex things and a lot of process and organizations seem to favor a certain amount of complexity to keep the cogs turning um, but us humans like when we actually have to bear that load and crank that cog around we don't want it to be complex so that's I guess where some of the checks and balances come in you know we we want to have that job security but we don't want to slave away any more than we have to for it at the same time so anyway you'll hear things like um, the basic software principles when as you're coding I don't want to make any more of an elaborate story about it than I have to. I could go on and on, but I'm just going to cut right to it. It's called DRY. It's an acronym. Don't repeat yourself. And I'll say that again. No, actually I won't because I'm not going to repeat myself, but it's that important. It is the very first one. Don't repeat yourself. Yeah, you can repeat yourself a couple times or something but as soon as you repeat yourself you should at least think that in your head as soon as you're typing some code like I don't even want to go into an example right now I just want to keep it really simple but as soon as you type the same thing twice you know um, consider it but if you sometimes there are reasons to do things what seem like repeating like you can only break something down then like say we did do something like uh, B equals 4 plus 4 or something right and then we come down here and we go A equals 4 plus 4 and it so there is some repetition there and it's like well is that really a big deal or what that's up to you if when you code stuff out you probably should start like that I mean if you're gonna duplicate something so huge that you actually think like wow I've got to type a whole nother page that's identical or something then obviously that's like give me a break you really want to take not duplicating serious but right here with something like this if you're just like hacking out some code to see like you know what um, I want to see if I print what does a plus B equal for some you know Obviously, I'm just being super simple in general, but, you know, they're just apply this to whatever little practical scenario. I better comment that out. So, down there at the bottom, it says 16. Cool. All right. That's what I wanted to know. That confirms whatever. Um, my boss will be happy and all that fine you're done you just prototype code that's what's up like when you prototype it's about just knock it out confirm or whatever maybe not some ideas you have or just maybe like in this this is what these REPL shells and these languages are tailored for is not only for beginners but also for more advanced users as well to um, be able to come over here I didn't have to do like a long compile or anything I was just able to like literally paste in that code I didn't even have to wrap it in a function you know so that's pretty handy but anyway if we do come and our boss is like you know what that's really good code we should start expanding we should add C and D to this program and uh, whatever and I start thinking wow okay now how's this gonna scale he wants to add C and D or she or however they identify um, and you know, maybe they could end up wanting to add the whole alphabet. What am I going to do here? Am I really... Okay, I could... Let's just do it. Whatever. This is probably the more rookie scenario. Some people get stuck into this. Maybe you already see where I'm going with it. Oops. Okay, 4 plus 4. Okay, cool. Boss is happy with that. Whatever. Every Let's make sure it compiles. Yeah, we didn't tell the boss we didn't compile it but whatever they just know CND is added to the program that's cool um, oh you know what they want to add uh, they want to change CND so that 
actually all of them. They want to change all of them so that it's four times five instead of four plus four. So it's like, oh wow, really? We got to change this to multiplication, change that. Okay, what do I do? Like a copy and paste, right? So that's kind of like you can start seeing where the stumbling block starts happening right there. And it's at that point where when you realize that either you run into this scenario on a small scale like this, it's like, okay, big deal. I see that I'm having to go back and make that change. Forget about it. Like, I'm going to just take this and I'm going to say B equals, you know, uh, add uh, four. Well, we don't want it. <laughs> that would be stupid hard coding. Okay, B equals add function just to be long and wordy. No, I'll be short. So first of all, I should put it back there, like four plus four was the first one. And then I'll put the A in, like we've reached at least that scenario where we're like, all right, little flag on the field, we duplicated, like, should there be some type of action because of this? Okay, so what we're gonna do is look at what, what, what are we accomplishing right here? We're accomplishing addition that's the function and we're passing it it's got two parameters to it okay so we want to add four and four we want to add a number and a number okay so we're gonna make a function called add and we're gonna give it um, four and four I mean this is obviously like it's still um, duplicating like this shows where it were a uh, one way where you're going overboard maybe if you do this but technically what we're doing here is you know anyway it should be a good example so we'll do function add and it's going to have to return a uh, I guess a single precision float that's what this is QBasic that's what most basics default to so function add it's going to take two numbers um, a and b and then we're going to say we want to return it. So to return that value in QBasic, you do uh, the name of the function. You set the name of the function to the value that you want to return. So we'll just say A plus B. So this is kind of like if you're familiar with lambdas in other languages, uh, when you want to use like this is just like a function expression, right? Just one line. OK. So. Yeah, this should work. Now we'll do our little test. There it is. Six, well, let's go ahead and clear the screen at the top here so that we can have a clean slate. So 16. Cool, it's still working. And right there, if you're familiar with test-driven development, what I just did was I ran a little test on my little isolated unit. And that's effectively all test-driven development is, is, um, is really that. It's sort of like documenting that and including that little step is sort of an automated process so instead of me literally have to like look at that value but um this is a situation where even if you are a test driven developer you don't necessarily have to it's only when you're writing that code that could end up in production um when you when you're like okay i'm gonna sit down and write enterprise grade code right you definitely want to use test driven development then but if you're not doing that then it's completely up to you I I mean you'll find yourself if you do learn all the stuff to do with test driven development um, the reason a lot of people say like oh I let that drive my architecture and stuff and that's really good and it will only kind of like drive you halfway there you know you really have to kind of know the rest of the principles and kind of how they fit in and stuff to to get the rest of the way but it will get you asking the right questions about things um, even if you're not necessarily always even acting on them right away. And that's what's important, is that you're you're asking yourself those questions all the time. So you can write a giant monolithic function, you know, and that's encouraged. If you read what the best programmers have to say out there, they're going to tell you that. And I don't remember if I just truly, it's one of those things where I feel like I want to say I came to that conclusion on my own, but going back and rereading so much stuff that over the last several years that I've read, I'm like, wow, there, that answer was buried in there. You know, I feel like I came to that conclusion about like, write the monolith. Um, 
I feel like I came to that conclusion myself, but it's all there. So there's all the people that I seem to respect. Um, anybody who says anything about it says start with that approach. And that's totally what I do. Um, if you continue down the road with that approach and don't question yourself and don't eventually start making some, uh, you know, letting your your architecture emerge and evolve at the at a healthy pace, then um, then you're going to fall into that technical debt category and have fragile code and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, this um, we've got rid of our code duplication and now it's a function duplication. And this basically goes to show you almost whether or not it's worth it um, to actually push out to the function or not. You know, if it's that petty, then it's like, well, what did we really solve by doing that? You know, it it's arguably less readable. But at the same time, you know, then it's arguably just as readable, right? The thing is, though, is that this is just, you know, if you're on the fence with it like this, I didn't even realize how good this example would end up like this. But it's like, well, it's roughly, I mean, it's a few more characters long, so that technically is more complexity. And it's in a function, which you just saw. I have to hit F2 and go over here and then wrap it with all this code. So that it doesn't justify it. This is not justified. Um, so we need to pit that back. It didn't solve the problem. If we wanted to change the fours, we'd still have to change them just as many times. So that's one of the few scenarios where extracting a method isn't even worth it. A lot of other times, if you question yourself on that, if it's anything beyond that complexity, right up on that line like that, extract method's probably going to be the best choice. Um, but yeah, this is, that's why I was saying, one of the reasons I was saying this seems like such a good example because it's one of the few times when it seems like it would be, but it's not. So uh, right here, our problem with the duplication is these numbers. So we could just change our number and call it n, set it to 4, and then come down here and change these all to n. Run it. Oh, I messed it up with that. QBasic doesn't like, I guess, if you don't. F2. And function. All right. So it still worked. And, but then this also doesn't help if we only want to change one of the things. So now it's turning into a bad example because I'm not really prepared to present it like this. So I'll just put a P here for no good reason and a P there. And then we can set P, of course. P equals five. So anyway, that's just one of the ways that you could solve like the don't repeat yourself thing. Um, if it get if it, this was like a really long one, you know, if this was like plus 13 minus uh, X, whatever, if it was something like that to where it starts looking like gibberish and it's not just immediately apparent to look at it, like what's this even doing, you know, then throw it in a function, you know, by then it could be like, uh, make huge calculation or something, or that wouldn't even be that good. In most times, um, you'd want to say like calculate rate or something, whatever it's accomplishing, right? And then that will be a time. Um, I guess that's not a good example of not repeating yourself, but just while we're on the subject right there, like of just making your code more repeatable. If you're wanting to, uh, if you're being tempted to stick a comment right here, a C style comment, that won't work, but there's a basic style one. So if you did something like that and you still had like X plus Y minus Z or something, and you're doing that, that's fine. Like go through your code, don't hate on yourself, especially if you're doing like what we've been talking about, the spike code, where you're just 
writing something to see if it works or whatever, do all that. Then it's right. We haven't even filled up a full old screen DOS page yet. You know, like this, it's no big deal. But those are smells. So that's telling you, like, you know, maybe consider pulling this out to a function. Like, especially if we just end up with lines and lines of code and we're way down here, you know, and there's just all sorts of these lines of code in here. And we're having to go back and forth, up and down to like see what's going on here. And try and balance all the like, what's DFSG? Okay, what's it doing with FSG? It's just not reading good and not making sense. It's too computery, you know? Then that's when it's like, just get rid of that stuff and just say, you know, like just turn that into a function. Calculate rate and then pass it A and then, you know, just come right here and there's a time when it is okay to copy and paste code when you, you know you just got to be careful with copying and pasting and understand what you're doing but right there's a, an example of duplication that's fine you know oh you know I should have stored those in a variable right why didn't that automatically space out okay so and then we could come down here. Oh, I didn't really make a function. Okay, so yeah, that's how you do it. And then of course you would make the function that had those formulas in it just like I did earlier. And um, then your code's more readable, more succinct. And once again, just a simple couple calls to that isn't necessarily duplication in this one little event right here. Uh, most, almost any other time where it goes beyond, you know, like a word or two kind of like or a couple values then it is that's that's true duplication but sometimes it's just what am i going to do do i just really make a call that's like um you know calculate rate twice <laughs> or you know what i mean I, i'm there's probably some realistic scenarios for it or better examples where you might really want to do what i'm talking about like calculate rate twice but that then you know go make that function and have it call calculate rate right? and then I'd have to pass it like I don't know then obviously which whatever direction I think I'm going right here with it it's going to be way more complex and it's just not even worth it even if I think I'm like arbitrarily like following some rule or something um they're not rules or guidelines and they're usually for the more you progress you know if you can read your code that's the first thing that matters the most, right? But these simple principles that I just need to get on the ball and finish talking about dry, that's the main takeaway right here, right? Um, so try not to repeat yourself with anything big. Push it off to like a function or whatever. Then the next one. What's a good one? Oh, who cares? I'll just leave it at dry for right now. That's a good one to just think about. Um, so I was speaking of the floating points. That's turned into like a, a really narrow but deep rabbit hole. And um, I thought I would. Apparently, I I don't know. I'm under the impression that like maybe nobody completely understands them. Or the people who seem to understand them the most say that. Maybe because, I don't know, but I feel like that. I feel like, wow, this is trippy. But I do have some understanding of them, and I was wanting to make a video about it. But during the process, I was doing sort of like what um, Kent Beck, I think he picked up the idea from somebody else, but he was referring to it as the test commit revert, TCR. And it's the idea of you literally test and commit or revert your code. So anyway, it's just like um, you just write some stuff and if you don't like it or whatever, you, you just throw it away. And if you do like it, then you save it. So if you don't end up like at least committing it as you know, into your commit log, then it's just going to vanish. You're going to rewrite everything that you don't commit if you need to use it like that. So it kind of like makes you think about the problem, you know, reason about it, critically think about it more, or just get used to, uh, you know, like almost like a little code kata, a lot like a code kata. And 
I was taking that approach because I thought like, you know, I don't want to save stuff and be going back. And I like the feeling of being able to just like sort of express what I'm talking about in code at the moment, if I can. Um, I've tried both approaches where, you know, go through and pre-code stuff, but it's just like, it's so much more disjointed. It's trying to like jump back a little bit more about like, why did I do that like that at that point in time, you know? And so my mind gets caught up with that and because maybe I did that in the morning and now I'm recording in the evening and trying to redo it or something, you know? So it's like that. But if I just sit down and do it, it's like, yeah, I might not. Either way, I'm going to miss pieces, right? I'm not going to get everything right. I'm going to screw up terminology, all that. So I'll just code it out. Or at least that's the the method that I'm really leaning towards lately. And um, so just thinking about that, that test commit revert thing, that's how I've been doing a lot of this. So that anyway, with the single and double precision floating point radix numbers, it's just... I ended up having to type a lot of this out a lot more than I wanted to. Um, but now it's been a minute. I took a break from it, so it's like I would have to think about it to code it back out again. And I thought, well, that's a good example. So, um, like I said, it's I haven't messed with it in at least a few days or more. Um, so I'll go ahead and jam it out. So what I was doing was I wanted to accomplish... Uh, seeing the bits of how a floating point number is stored in memory because there's this thing called the a standard the IEEE um, 754 document and then especially the 1985 version of that is uh, that's the standard that 98 plus percent of all computers use like probably even a higher percentage than that there's I think a couple, like the Cray, any Crays, if they're still out there, and some of the IBM stuff, like there's a little lineage of that that uses, I think, like slightly different um, floating point thing. And then there's the Microsoft MBF format, which is even older than this QBasic program. So you're probably not going to run into that, but that would be like overlapping into the 8-bit basic days and stuff. Um, so basically, it, it basically came down to the fact that like by 1984, everything that most any human was ever going to put their hands on was already using the IEEE 754 before this standard because it's actually based on the Intel um, 8086 8087 coprocessor chip so um, in these original all of our computers now or most all you know that aren't ARM and stuff that are based on the Intel and of course AMD and a few other people as well chipsets they uh, originally didn't have the um, floating point unit built into the, the central processing unit. So that's something we might take for granted more these days, but that was an extra thing. That was like, um, and nobody, we hadn't standardized on it. It was like, okay, yeah, there's approaches to do it. So people will just implement it in software, you know, and just kind of do whatever worked for whatever given scenario. But anyway, um, Intel implemented that, and then they start shipping these hard chips, right? And this is right in the beginning, like virtually, you know, plus or minus 1980, right? And uh, then they start flooding the micro, the yeah, speaking of Microsoft, they start flooding the market with these in IBM PCs that are these, and the international business machines. They start taking up the international business, and everybody's getting those big clunky IBM XTs and all that stuff so that was basically just really in support for that to become the standard you know it was like de facto conventional kind of thing and plus a lot of people applaud it for um, for the way it is handled you know they just sort of pick like well this is probably the best way to do it and to this day it's pretty much still done like this Everything, even if it deviates a tiniest little bit from this 1985 standard, they're going to refer to it. They're going to refer to this standard as the, that, like, to give you that delta. Because um, that, that's what it was, you know. It was like, like I said, it was an industry standard. Then IEEE came in and put it on paper and charged everybody 100 bucks for it or whatever. So 
that just made it even more so and they've updated it a couple times since then um they just basically like one time pretty much updated the terminology and then i think maybe most recently um they changed it like not a number value or something i don't know they changed something that seemed kind of stupid for them to change but it's almost like if these standards start changing things really haphazardly then um they almost like justify their own existence like that's what it seems like ecma script's been doing with javascript it's like es3 came out um people have their issues with javascript right you know it in my opinion it's a very nice little language um or it used to be little anyway but it you know it was given a big task it was like the little boy given or little girl or little stuffed animal or whatever you want to think you know given a bow and arrow and like sent out in the field or whatever or like go try and like hit a target or something and then it turns out whoa that <laughs> you know sent off to like slay a dragon i don't know kind of a thing where it's like whoa you know there was like so much courage there and whatever it's like it's a dragon you can't get on to the whoever got sent out there to do whatever so that's what i feel about javascript is there's a lot of that you know they're like oh it's not secure enough language you know and whatever it should have been this and that it's like yeah all the none of these languages really are none of them are up to snuff and most people didn't even ever learn javascript properly like and it just had multiple ways to do things the writer way but it's hard i and the thing people that trip people up the most was terminology i think like the word prototype do you know anything about prototype prototypical prototypal inheritance um it's scary terms like it's a joke because and then when you read about it i've gone back and i read about it every description of it and it's simple stuff it is so simple it's simpler than the class-based systems right but the terminology and the words it's like you get these classes one syllable I, it sounds stupid and silly maybe but it's one syllable these are basic facts of like how we think about things like how we can remember a phone number like those basic ux kind of things and prototype is three syllables so that right there there's we automatically like prototype that's enough to like boil your blood a little bit or something like to get you going and then when they talk about the prototype, the way it works isn't quite the way I think most people want it to fall in place for whatever reasons, but it's, it was based on the self language. Um, I'm pretty sure it follows it almost exactly like that language. And I've read both of their documentation, so I'd be surprised if it was different because when, if you read about self, and you're familiar at all with the old JavaScript, the older style JavaScript, you'll forget you're reading about self and you'll think you're just reading about prototypal inheritance and JavaScript. But anyway, um, there's that system and that favors composition. You know, you have, you don't have this extra class to deal with. So for one thing, it's not promoting that. It's not promoting the idea of like, oh, maybe a static method might work or something. You know, it's, it's promoting the more correct way to do object-oriented design. But anyway, I'm going to shut up about that for now. This this is the floating point standard, 1985, whatever. It costs money. So that's one bad thing about it, too, is that you can only get secondhand information, you know, if you're going to do the honest policy thing unless you pay up you can only get the uh, somebody else's review that's read that document um, it's not that long of a document I've never read it all the way through I don't like download it and save it I'll occasionally a couple times I've searched out a copy online just to start reviewing it I plan to read it end to end just to make sure that everything's lined up you know for like under like some fair use kind of purposes like that just to whatever stay on that side of things but 
I just want to feel like I have my understanding from it first. So anyway, long story short, I'm probably like 10 hours into this, long story long. I'm going to have a declare a number. They call it dimension and QBasic and some of the basics. So I'm going to dimension. Uh, we're going to start out simple with an integer because a floating point is... Okay, so there's eight bits in a byte, right? Eight ones or zeros, like eight little slots in each byte. And then there's four of those bytes in a 32-bit integer. This is QBasic. It's old from back in the day. So it was like the early days integers were only 16 bits for a while because that's all the processing. The integer was set to the word size of the processor. And, of course, there were 16-bit processors throughout, like, maybe most of the 80s was the 16-bit heyday. And then, of course, by the mid-90s, finally, the popular operating systems had all caught up. And they had all gone to 32 bits. And that's when Java dropped in, too. And they started out as a 32-bit only platform. To this day, to my knowledge, it's still a 32-bit only platform. You probably have seen that there are 64-bit downloads of Java. But um, that's more for the native interfacing. So if you have like 64-bit Windows and you're going to do 64-bit DLLs and stuff like that, then you're going to want the 64-bit version of Java. And, of course, if you're interfacing with 32-bit shared libraries, you're going to want the 32-bit um, the version of Java. So, anyway, that's the little difference there of why you see a 32- and 64-bit version. But, anyway, we're not here to talk about Java. Um, so, I'm going to declare an integer, which is just a whole number, right? And then I want to look at at the bytes of that integer. So I'm going to set the integer to something interesting like 1. Oop. I equals 1. Okay, so in basic, one of the cool things you can do in these more real mode operating systems from like basically uh, everything before the 90s, like I don't really consider Windows 3 to be an operating system, but everything before the mid 90s, right? Before Windows was being installed and started up by default, if you're in the real mode, in the completely unprotected memory access mode, you could access the, um, you could look at every byte of memory out of the box on computers. So when you're running a program, there's virtually nothing hidden from you. Um, Nowadays, it's different. You're giving a virtual environment each one of your programs that runs, and you can only see the memory, um, this window that is given to you. It's actually like put there in software and in hardware, too. There's hardware support in the processor, but each layer up the chain will virtualize it, so everybody is switching the mailbox numbers on everybody all the way up. Um, that even actually happens... To my knowledge, it should happen even on on these old 16-bit real mode ones too. So even if I say, you know, my bytes at address 516 or something, right? Um, the operating system below me might be like, oh, you know what? We'll we'll go ahead every time you ask for that byte at 516. We'll give them this when he expects, but we're actually going to store it at 428 because that just is more convenient for us, right? So and then the the operating system hands that down to the processor, right? And or at that level. And then at that low level, the instructions look at it and think, you know, oh, same thing. Like, oh, maybe we want to store this at 48 instead. And so that's there's sort of that abstraction, um, that encapsulation kind of a thing going on there, up and down the chain. But it doesn't matter to us because unless you know for some reason you're writing. Like if you're working for Spinrite or something, writing some real low-level stuff, or maybe in an embedded situation. But as you can see, at anything that is giving you an interface like this or more modern-looking, you're probably looking at several or more layers of abstraction. So that being said, this is stored at one of those numbers. It's some pigeonhole that's a byte. 8 bits of memory, that's the smallest amount of memory you can reference in a computer at once. Um, you can 
look at the bits of the bite, but you have to pick up the whole bite to look at those bits. Okay. And a lot of computers, too, you're going to pick up more than a bite, too, because it's just an optimal thing of like, hey, we actually grabbed you a handful of bites, you know, just in case. It would have been, <laughs> we would have had to do more work to delete those extra bites than to just hand them to you with this, so take what you want out of it. But, um, so what we can do is we can peek at that memory. We can say peek at the uh, the memory location. There's actually a little bit of setup code I need to do here. I need to set the default segment because in 16-bit, um, what you do is you set you sort of set this base of memory of where to go, and then. It's sort of like you could think of as a room full of mailboxes, right? So the segment is like the room with those like cubby holes in it. And so we have to set that to the segment that our variable, I probably wouldn't even have to do this, but you're supposed to do it to be safe in case the variable's in another room. So I'm just going to do that. And then also you want to switch back to that front room when you're done. So that's default segment without any value switches us back. And then we'll go ahead and indent right here so that we know that we're whatever it's not a big deal we don't even have to really think about that part from here out and I could probably delete it and get away with it in this simple of an example but any more complex scenario I wouldn't and then inside of here we want to peek at the um, this the variable pointer to I so actually I'll just go ahead and print this first so you can see it so we'll print the uh, the location that that mailbox number of uh, I there. There it is three two four six eight. And so if we came up here and made it another one, we'll make one that's a float too. Dim f as a single precision floating point number. And then we'll set f right here. F equals one point oh. That's something QBasic does as a little qualifier to say that it's a single precision floating point number. It's kind of funny the times when it chooses to do that or not. But anyway, uh, now we can add that one. It should be a different mailbox number or else something's wrong. And do a shift F5. And there it is. The other one's still at the same number and this one's a few doors down at 32524. All right, and then let's even see what the segment is too, just for fun. Print, fair, seg, and I'm duplicating code right here, right? So I've got that little flag in my head. And the the first part is 16. Oh, so really, what it would look like is uh, if I do that and then duplicate this code right here. Tons of flags on the field. Um, that little semicolon is just making it so that it um, stays on the same line after you print. And actually, I meant to add a colon right there, kind of separate the base from the offset value. And they went ahead and added the semicolon, which I didn't want to have to deal with. So there it is. That's a little bit more how normal. Um, maybe like a hexadecimal kind of viewer or debugger or something might show it to you. And those are the addresses that it's at. But anyway, should I leave this video right here? I've been talking forever. There's been dry, there's been this, there's been that. So these are just pointers. And I'm going to leave it at that for now because I really have to pee. Actually, I'll just pause it. Where's the freaking pause? <clears throat> All right. Okay, so 
I want to go ahead and stick with the mission now. Now that we know where the memory, what's going on, kind of. So we're going to peek at the bite. I'm going to effectively, it's going to do the thing in the in here first, right? Well, literally, it's going to evaluate that first, which is just going to be like, hey, I'm a variable, right? I'm evaluating to, to one or whatever, which is interesting now that I think about that part. I don't want to get too deep into that, but I was under the impression these variables get passed by value, which means they're copied, so the reference... So that's kind of deceiving to look. That would actually have to work more like a keyword, I think, since this variable, these parentheses in basic, make it pass by value instead of by reference, supposedly sticking with the continuity of the language. But anyway, that's a little bit beyond right now. Um, that uh, it's it's giving us the pointer to that variable, effectively. And then this peak thing is going to give us the byte behind that pointer, which should only be half of this value. So let's go ahead and run it. Oh, expected statement. So peak's going to give us that byte back, and QBasic likes to yell at us if we throw away that byte like I was about to do. So I actually have to do something with it, which is what we wanted to do, so that's cool. One. <laughs> So it's that offset. Oh, that's the byte value. That's right. I was thinking that was the variable pointer value again. Yeah, one is the byte value. And then if we do the same exact thing, but uh, do a plus one right here, then we should get the second byte. Because this is something called pointer arithmetic, and people try and act like it's real scary. And it's funny that you can do that in QBasic right here. but not a lot of languages of allow you um, that low level of access. That's one of the cool things about the C and C++ kind of family of languages is that the real ones, not just the ones that copy the syntax or whatever, is being that what they call a middle level language where it actually lets you have access to those so-called memory values, you know, or they are memory values, but um, at whatever so-called location, right? At that, that pigeonhole location. So that's what a pointer is, is it's a pigeonhole. It's the mailbox number of a pigeonhole. Um, and so what we're doing is, like, we're using that lowest common thing. So we're going to go by a byte, add a byte to it. In other languages, it goes by the type. So whatever uh, you set the pointer and you say, hey, I'm pointing at an integer. So this right here, if you look at this line of code, there's nothing that says, like, specifically that's pointing at an integer. I mean, the the QBasic environment itself could decipher that, but um, it there there's nothing syntactual that's telling like the compiler or the interpreter that, um, so it doesn't know like to go, uh, that in this case that it's gonna be 16 bits, two bytes, and that if it wants to find the second integer, it's going to have to skip two bytes at a time, right? So in a language like C or C++, it's going to do that because your pointers are usually, you know, obviously typed. But um, anyway, it's cool that QBasic even allows you to do this, you know, to do that pointer arithmetic like that. Like, you can't do that in Java. At least I don't know of any way to do it. Okay, <clears throat> and if you did, it would probably be some horrid-looking construct, and there would be all these things to watch out for when using it. So because the second one, this should be all zeros. And it's a zero because that's the total byte value, right? So basically, I'll just let you know behind the scenes what was going on was we were getting back an 0001, right? And then an 000, just like that. So what's funny about that is that this integer, the real integer up here, like as far as we think of, um, you know, if we were to talk about it outside of like some specific system, it would be 
that's how that integer would be stored. That's how you describe if somebody's like, write a one in a eight bit binary format, you'd write it like that. You know, this four digit pit in a space, that's kind of like pit in a comma every three digits. That's a pretty common one. Um, sometimes there'll be a dash to show that it's part like if we're doing 16 bit, like a hexadecimal layout with 16 bit, you know, that way you could tell the difference between that one and, oh, not nines, uh, like, you know, something like that. So whatever, but this space, I, I stick with that convention a lot. And then these are nibbles. So maybe you could say these are like the smallest that a human might think of like the smallest bite it's a nibble like literally like there's bites and there's nibbles right um, this way you can see like it gives you enough to to digest at a time you know it's kind of maybe like a hundred or something or a thousand but yeah so anyway it's stored differently in here Intel's a little Indian system a memory storage system where it stores the least significant byte first in memory in the memory first as in ascending memory values memory numeric values and uh, it's going to be stored in the lowest the lowest byte is going to be stored in that lowest box it's kind of confusing to say that because then the stack on the Intel systems is from the top down right and so you can get into like a pickle if you start trying to think about wait a minute the way you describe that but anyway yeah that it's just basically flipping your bytes on you like that so you've got to read them backwards to to get what you want but there's a certain little optimization from them doing that um you know what i mean like you can but like I can show you right now, just one of the coincidental kind of optimizations from doing that. So there's the Verisec pointer. And where do we? Okay, so we need the. So right now I know that I would want to do like print. P I want to start doing the whole same thing again. Fair on to go ahead and duplicate it one time if it's not too much, just type it out. I want I or I plus one. I've never tried it like that. I'll try it like that. And uh, so I'm basically I'm kind of duplicating stuff, right? And it's getting to where they don't like that there. Cool. Okay, cool. There they are, the two by values but we want the we want them like that we want them we want to be able to see them and reason about them as real as the real bits so we've got to convert this stuff so let's break it apart let's decompose our problem right here so we've got this first byte of eight bits what do we want to do with that to to break it down okay well I'll just hurt you up and try and finish some of this stuff and say that like there's a simple formula one of the simple formulas is to just go uh, take that value well now I'm going to type ver pointer to I again and just my own laziness makes me not want to do that so right here I'll set what the, uh, the ver pointer is equal to ver ptr That's a keyword, so I can't use it. So, um, what is I? It's our integer pointer. Int PTR. Is that a bad name? I feel all pressured now. Okay, so. Verseg I is an integer, and we're going to get a pointer to it. So we'll just call it pointer. When in doubt, so now we can replace any place where that was at with a pointer. You're going to peek at the pointer. And this one can be pointer plus one. 
make sure it works. Cell test driven development works, any little change. Um, and that way you know, like, oh, that was obviously like the last thing I did and the less last things you did before you run that little test, the more narrowed down the problem is and how quick and easy you can fix it. So pointer plus one, that's all working. Then we need to, actually, I want to just go ahead and peek at it right here too. We don't need that, um, that address number, you know. We need the byte value. You can always probably safer and bigger code to do, uh, and then we can get rid of the whole peak too and just change that to byte. So, right there, that's a refactor. What I just did, it's all effectively doing the same exact. Oh, I forgot to plus one down. Uh, so, yeah, that. Uh, anyway, the refactors where you don't, the code doesn't change, right? Um, if this would have been test, real test driven development, test first development, where the codes are actually like the uh, expectations are put into code. And like I wrote a function that tested this function and said, made sure that everything was right. When when I just went in and was like, I'm going to clean up the code and make it look real simple like this. But all of a sudden, everybody, I'm like, hey, look how easy I made it. And then I turn it in and it's like, uh, what's going on? It's supposed to be a one and a zero there. It's a one and a one now. So uh, test-driven development would have had a test pointed at that little spot, that behavior. And it would have been expecting, you know, if I give it this, then I should get that then it would have been like, bam, red flag. And it was it told me before I even went and tried to show off the code or commit it or anything, it would have said, hey, you're screwing up. So that right there, I hope kind of you could see how that could illustrate a lot of the benefits of putting those tests in there. And then you don't have to worry about that. No person has to sit there and think like, oh, every time I run that, that better be a one and a zero, you know, like make sure, you know, oh, so-and-so's leaving the company, make sure somebody else walks around remembering that that's supposed to be a one and a zero, you know, it's like, give me a break, just put a test in there, and it will throw up a giant red flag, even if somebody's never seen the function, all of a sudden, red flag, what's the problem, this was supposed to be a one and a zero, oh, okay, and you go look at this little simple function, and oh, there's the problem, the guy was trying to be slick, and he forgot to add the the plus one, you know, value to it or whatever. So, uh, this would have to be byte two. <laughs> this is horrible programming. I can't believe I'm even using this as an example. The thing is, I know that some college professors still do it this bad too, which is so sad. This is my one and only time, so enjoy it. I will never code like this again. Um, and there it is. It works now, right? So obviously byte two, huge, that's a code smell before people even knew what the term was, right? It's like, why not use an array or something? Like there's all sorts of questions you should be asking yourself at that point. But I'm doing tons of duplication here. Every time I want to change something, I'm just like doubling down on the duplication every single time. So I knew it beforehand and I kind of had to let myself fall into this trap so that it, it could be like paint a little picture. But, um, and you might have too. And so it's like, it's, we know what we want. Oops. Um, we want a for loop right here. It's a finite loop. And we know how many bytes there are. There's two bytes. So we'll say from uh, for. Normally people use i is the convention. So I'll just do n for number. Which sounds a little vague, but whatever. And then f still float. Okay. And that's why it's even better to give, I'm not going to do it right now. I'm not even going to change this because that's going to change refactor too much code. But if I would have typed in, like gave this value a meaning, like I can't type integer because that's a keyword, but in a lot of other languages that's not. So you literally could if you wanted to, but I could even type int, which is usually the keyword in other languages, but in this one it's not. And that would be, um, or I guess it is a keyword in this one, it's specs statement. But my special number like that's more descriptive then at least it's it's like what's i and plus i it's like right here i'm going to use it again like i because that's the common convention in one of these things but anyway um for this small example i'm just showing you why you why there's reasons it's like oh you might want not want to give your variable a meaningful name but 
to not give it a meaningful name other than the most bare bones simplest examples uh it you run, run into name collisions so the more letters and numbers or whatever characters you give that name the more like i guess you could look at it as like entropy in the system you're pitting so that it's like the less chance of a collision you know so anyway um we're going to use just n here for n equals uh, 0, which is common. In basic, it's cool because you could actually even just do like 1, 2, uh, 2 bits like that. But I'm personally so accustomed to using the 0, and especially in this scenario, another perfect example is that uh, that for loop is actually going to have to go out here and have this stuff over and what we're doing here is we're going to pull in this this thing plus the number that we're on and what it's going to do is it's going to do that pointer arithmetic right so it's automatically just going to add whatever we're on and that right there is the reason that a lot of these start at zero because under the hood a lot of this pointer arithmetic stuff's going on even in the languages where you're not allowed to use it or see it they're working like this under the hood so when it comes down here it's effectively that first time n is going to be equal to zero so it's just going to be like that like n wasn't there it's not going to add anything to that pointer so we'll get that effect but then as many more times as we want to go through the loop i mean n then it will uh it will add it. so that's i think that's a beautifully simple example good example of that personally and then to end the for loop we need to do a next and I'll just be explicit and make sure I wouldn't have to fit that in but that's just sort of making sure it's this one um, and it's gonna print the byte so it we should get two bytes printed we should let's think about it so we're gonna uh, start at the beginning you know make sure we're still on the same page with all this so we're gonna clear the screen we're gonna dimension um, in the memory i as an integer we're going to dimension in the memory f as a single precision floating point number we're going to i gets the value 1 which is equivalent to that and then f is going to get that which is the equivalent to that and 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and 1 2 3 4 So eight and three and one that should be right and that's equal to some amount of bits like that I spaced them out a little bit different than the convention I was telling you because with floating point numbers the first one is the sign bit so if, if that was negative that'd be a one and if it's positive it will be a zero and then uh, these eight bits are the exponent value and that's a base two exponent value unless I'm wrong um, I wouldn't be surprised if I got that wrong but I'm pretty sure that's base 2 exponent value right there and uh, this is the uh, mantissa or the significant it's the fractional portion which is weird to think about the, uh, for me anyway to think in those terms because when I think of a decimal value I it's not the way you probably think about it if you're anything like me which I think is leaning more towards a normal human being but I'm not the best at math I'm pretty fast at like light algebra and down like I've raced really good people at that when I was in school and stuff and I won you know like everybody literally but as soon as you get into like anything more than basic algebra and beyond I'm completely I mean I can sit down and understand pieces of it right when I need to, but um, I'm for the most part completely lost. Or it's like, like for I'll, some people are with programming languages, I am with math. Like, but anyway, um, yeah. So I didn't run this yet, did I? So there it is, one and zero, just like we expect. And the trick here is to do a little math equation. And we're going to, if we divide our byte by 2 and get the remainder, then that remainder is the lowest bit of that byte. So it would be the one on the far right. So if we say that first 
um, byte is 1, right? When we divide it by 2, we're going to get 0. Hmm. Wait, 1? What, what am I doing wrong here? See, I told you I'm bad at math. Like, <laughs> you divide it by 2 and get... Well, I just barely let the computer do it. <laughs> I don't... I'm lost right now. Um, and then we're going to set the byte value. Well... Trying to get, like I said, I did not prepare for this at all. I was just like, I'm going to sit. I was going through the motions of preparing some days ago, but uh, starting to anyway, but I did not. I just sat down. This was kind of stupid. Like, but anyway, um, so if we take the byte, and I know I have to do in QBasic that I have to do integer division, I have to put in parentheses because for some reason, it does not fall in the proper precedence order. I don't know why. Byte divided by two, and uh, the remainder of that. And QBasic does not have the modulo operator. So a, mod <laughs> a modulo is like, if you take a number divided by two, and then times it by two, so you divide it by two and throw away the fractional remainder part, right? And then you get like that whole number, like five divided by two is 2.5, but we're going to throw away the 0.5. So five integer division style divided by two truncated, you get two. Then you times that back by the same thing. It was divided by two, let's times it by two. And then you end up with only four, right? So then you subtract four from five and you get the difference that's effectively your remainder. That's what a modulo, to my understanding, is. And it's like, well, why would you want to do all that? That's my question anyway. Well, right now I want to get the effect of the modulo without it. So to my knowledge, I cannot say the remainder. Uh, let's just try it right here in the print statement and say, Yeah, it doesn't even know. Like, if I go dig into the help file, I've already been here. Like, contents, character set. You got multiplication minus division, relational, greater than, plus, decimal point, less than, integer division, exponent. Yeah, bad. So, anyway, you got to do it the long, hard way. And that's to uh, say byte divided by two times two. And this threw me off for so long because I thought, you know, multiplication division, left to right in order, right? No, that's not the case because in QBasic with maybe some other languages for some reason, I don't know, but it you have to enforce the precedence like that or it will do it not like that. Um, Okay, byte divided by two times two, and then we got to do the original byte minus all that is what bytes gonna. Okay, so that will effectively effectively give us the modulo. And we have to do that a bunch of times, though. So it's going to be another for statement in here for each byte. Uh-oh. And we'll call this... Uh, Let's call it X, whatever. And that's another bad thing about not sticking to the convention with variable names. It's too easy to just get out of whack with it. And then it's like, oh, X, now i got to remember not to use X. and Or maybe not. But anyway, for that equals 0, 2, 7. So that's effectively the 8 bits of the byte. And so you can see, like, right here, my main point of doing all this, I picked kind of a bad example that's like a little bit of a head scratcher for me without like recently reviewing it. And this, uh, but the point is just to show that like it's okay to hash crap out like this. 
the way I see it, you know, like, this is what I do a lot of times, you know, or whatever, like, I just have fun with it, like, I'm not trying to stress out right now, like, yeah, there are times when I just, like, want to click in gear and be like, hey, I'm gonna, like, really code this out and, like, really be in tune with all this stuff, but other times it's like, you know what, I'm just dinking around and thinking about, like, all different stuff at once and everything, and, like, what, this is me when, like, nobody's watching kind of a thing, like, half the time, sometimes I'm on it, but, uh, yeah, anyway, print, byte minus byte, divided by two, stop and step through, that's the, the thing I always try and tell myself, and it's like, when I would tutor people, I would do that more, because it would just make more sense to them, but sometimes for myself, I'm kind of hard on myself, I think, in those kind of areas, and there is some laziness going on there but if you just think of the trade-off too it's like stop and step through because and during coding interviews like if you do like a really good you know leaning towards the proper side of like a technical coding interview they're going to ask you to step through your code like simple you know that's the uh when you're on the easier part of the code interview at least they're going to want you to do that for sure um I've never made it to the hard part of a code interview. I've done very few technical, like, real, kind of, not even real. Like, I have very little technical interview experience. But um, that's what I've gathered from it. And that, that was something I appreciated, was going back and stepping through the code. Like, it just doesn't seem like something. It seems like, oh, who wants to do that, you know, but doing that is what ultimately really makes you understand what's going on um it pits you back on the same page it's like less of a fight when you get down lower and stuff so you know you can come all the way to the top or you can just stay within whatever region you think makes sense and if you review that little portion and it doesn't make sense then go you know another block out or whatever and just keep going back but uh, this isn't very much and it really, you shouldn't have very much on your plate at once, so you should be able to really review it all in whole and not lose the beginning by the time you get to the end. Unless, of course, you know, you have a class that's kind of pushing the limits or something. Maybe you shouldn't have to understand the whole class, um, especially if it's not one that you designed or is in design cleanly or anything like that. So we're going to clear the screen. We're going to define our integers, or not our integers, our two number values. We're going to set those number values. Then we're going to set that segment, boilerplate. Uh, and we're going to come in here and say for uh, each one of the two bytes that make up our, our integer i, we're going to come down here and we're going to peek at the pointer it's in that segment, the offset value, get that little mailbox number in that room, that cubbyhole pigeon number, and uh, add zero to it the first time, store that in here, the resulting byte, um, so that byte's going to be eight bits, then for zero through seven of each one of those eight bits, we're going to come in, and I'm going to get rid of this, I'm going to keep it simple, I was jumping the gun right there, and just print, print, uh, print the byte so what should we maybe get like next x and we'll do this little thing so they all print on the same line oh yeah good that looks good yeah right nothing printed okay I forgot to put the variable there so it's byte all ones and a zero makes sense because it's just we're not doing any math on it yet so it's getting the first byte and then it's printing that whole entire byte value which oh you know it equals one because it's zero 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 one and you know normally we don't print with all the three zeros preceding it we could force it and format it to but that's extra work and um, that if it was two it would no longer, you know, it wouldn't be showing us only zeros or ones, so it's not a true binary representation anyway. So we don't want to do it like that. So what we need to do is in inside of this for loop right here, this is the one that's gonna we need to uh, go through each bit, and to do that we need to do 
we can uh, get the remainder of byte divided by two effectively if we get the remainder of that that will be our bit and then we take the number you know byte divided by two I swear if I could just show it on scratch paper it'd be so much easier but say uh, say we have the number what's a good one I guess 88 so we divide 88 by 2 I'm going to use the forward one but well I'll use the backwards one just to re kind of help remind us that it's throwing away any sort of remainder which this one's going to have um, 88 divided by 2 is going to be 44 and it's going to be remainder 0 so our first bit will be 0 right well, it's going to yell at me if I do that and then uh, then we take 44 divided by 2 and that would equal 22 remainder 0 and so on you know what I mean and we do that for each um, effectively for each bit of the byte and that's how you get it so if I threw in an odd, an odd number right in the beginning like um, 89 right it's going to be 44 remainder 1 so that would be the first one but what happens is since that was that lowest that lowest bit that I was talking about up here that um it's gonna pit it first it's gonna pit the one right like right here effectively which <laughs> so it would be completely backwards because Intel style is storing our first byte first and then this is printing our first bit first so it's it would be a hundred percent backwards like that I think pretty close to it <laughs> but um, anyway that's effectively what's going on so that you're not completely in the dark trying to wrap your head around what I'm trying to implement here so in imperative terms we got to tell QBasic how to accomplish that and it's easy for us to just do that in our head right but like I said there's no no remainder kind of an operator in here so we're gonna have to do that the hard way so okay just byte divided by byte divided by two times two and then we'll have to do byte minus that so that's going to give us the uh, the remainder right there. That's effectively the remainder. So we want to print that. So let's see if my theory was right. Um, I do need to put that in there to enforce precedence. So, but the, otherwise it should work because it's going to skip this the first round. It's going to look do the hunt for the well first round. It's going to evaluate everything in the parentheses. So it's going to do this division truncated if it's odd and or remainder from odd and then it's gonna multiply it by two <clears throat> and then it's going to subtract the original byte value from that and you know if there's a difference then that will effectively be the remainder and it will print that which will effectively be the bit value and then after it does that we got to change the uh, byte because it didn't there was no state change other than the screen right there our variable value even though we used it it didn't change so we got to change it and actually basically just divide byte by two and since it's the only thing I don't have to wrap it then uh, so they will save that truncated value like I showed you in that little should have left the comment on the screen kind of thing maybe maybe not but anyway so that will divide by by two so if we just stick in this little thing and say what are we doing so we're coming down here and you know our bytes equal to whatever and we're doing that formula to get the remainder and then we're um, we're cutting it in two and then coming back through doing the formula with the cut in two get the just get the print the remainder and then we're taking that divide in half value and stuffing it in here again and doing that that many times and then after it gets through this loop oh whoa weird what I do okay um, after it gets through that loop this one right here it's gonna drop back out to this outer loop 
and it's going to go grab the next byte, add that, make n1, come in here, add that to wherever i is at to get the next byte like we were talking about, and um, then it's going to drop in this loop, reset x to 0, and do the same thing in here, which x isn't being used, but it, you know, it will iterate through it. And let's check it out. Okay, there it is in completely reverse order. I can get it to not if I just add a semicolon out here, right? So there it is, and that's one completely backwards. Like if you, you know, there's the one on the far left, right? And then up here you can see it should be on the far right. So it really should be something like, like it should look like that. Um, what I didn't do 16 zeros on huh? something like that to make it easier. No, let's leave it like that so it's more consistent. Anyway, that should be 16 bits if it's not, but we can also do a thing to. Uh, pretty print that a little bit better too if we don't like all that spacing but I'm not going to do that just yet because it's the wrong order so what we need to do is flip everything around and it will be the right order I'm trying to remember what method I used to do that I saved it to a screen, uh, string instead of printing it so technically that would be a code smell too is to be you know, you think about single responsibility principle, if you've ever heard about that, like, oh, responsibility, that just breaks stuff up too much. It's like, yeah, but it, when it comes to this, when you got to make a change or something, when you got to, like, when you should ask some questions and stuff, it's like, well, how many reasons does this have to change? Well, if we want to change what how we're printing it, displaying it, it's got to change then. So that's a reason. Um, anything to do with I.O. is always a reason. And then... We also have to change it if, uh, like, our variable changes from an integer to something else. Um, you know, so we're not, now there's, like, because anything to do with, like, how we display the bytes of the variable or how we handle those is going to change. So there's, there's a multiple reasons starting to creep up in here, just to, to say. So I might be kind of, like exaggerating slightly at this point but it's there it's just waiting to happen so anyway this print is a smell anyway so it's good to get rid of that and just say let's put it in a byte string um, we'll just call it bit string bit str whatever for a bad name no every time I do something bad oh, okay today's bad bad stuff I'm allowed to do um, no, I'm not. I'm never allowed to do bad stuff. Bit string. Expect it. Oh, yeah, this colon is no longer necessary because it's not printing it. And then what can happen is once we get totally done building up that bit string, which is going to equal that, and then what we can do is normally it, um, it was going in backwards, right? So now we have control of it. And we can say bit, actually, that's right. We're in QBasic, so I can keep it short. The dollar sign means string. And then you don't even have to do like a dim statement. Um, it might not be the best practice in the world, but whatever. And it's not global automatically, to my knowledge, like JavaScript, if you don't declare it. So bit equals bit plus all of that so what we're gonna do now is like no that's wrong <laughs> that would do the same exact thing that it was doing before we want to do the opposite and add bit append the old bit string out here so we're gonna get that one first right and then it will we but we want it to be on the far right of the string so we're gonna build up our string to the left of that bit okay and then byte divided by two, and then once we get all the way out here, we can just um, print the bit string. 
check it out. Type mismatch. Oh yeah. So this is a numeric value right in here. So we just got to, uh, just having a little bit of trouble knowing that it's supposed to convert it to a string. So we'll just tell it to convert it to a string, please. Oh yeah, there's our number the way it should be with the one on the right. Well, it's just one ugly line of code. Okay, so now, now it looks exactly like that. But we want to get rid of those um, those little z like spaces between the zeros and stuff. And what that is is it's just one of the cool things with QBasic is you can actually like control because it knows that it's going to be running over DOS. Um, normally a terminal all you're guaranteed is like maybe a very short line at a time or something like maybe 12 characters if even that and a line at a time right so you can't really like manipulate and be like oh I have like a 80 by 25 screen and I want to move this mouse cursor all over it and do all the, like even what this editor is doing like that you have to have some low level knowledge of what type of a display system you're running on and stuff your terminal capabilities is what they call it in Linux right so anyway QBasic does some stuff where they make some assumptions for you and the way they print the number is that they put a little uh, a little space for the digit I I want to say it's like a space for the sign let's see if we do a negative or negative wouldn't show us on there yeah, it's well, we'll know right now because I think it's an L trim. So if we turn it into a string and then we left trim any space off of that string, uh, oops, string like that, yeah, yeah, so it must have been a space for the sign bit and it just automatically pits that there. I think I don't remember if the C print F, it's been a more than a few minutes since I used that but anyway that's something to look out for is with how there's always a little bit of trickiness to like formatting stuff on a terminal display um, sometimes they'll make assumptions for you or whatever and then you have to go back and like do something a little bit awkward like that but if you're in a quick scenario where you'll just you're just printing out a bunch of numbers hey they're not all end-to-end -end, like one giant number they're all spaced out and you didn't have to like that was one less little iteration you had to run so another thing about these like prototyping type of environments so anyway now that's prettier or more realistic and if we wanted we could even go break up the for loop and make it or a couple different ways but we could make it do the spaces like you know, every uh, four bits through here, you know, create a space or whatever. But that's some complexity I don't want to get into right now. So that works. Let's test it out if it's a negative number. All right. That's, uh, what is it called? Two's complement style. So let's do just two. There are ten kinds of people that understand binary or two what is it there are tens kinds of people those who understand binary and those who don't um, anyway that was the integer and now if we want to change this to a float a float single precision is going to be 32 bits which is four bytes which is zero through three it's still going to be that so we don't even have to change any of that out and this is just the number one as a single precision. That looks wrong to me, but I could be wrong. Um, oh, I didn't pass it the right. I forgot to change the pointer to F. Okay, that's looking righter. one but it's not yeah the two shouldn't have been that many maybe what am I missing here fair seg of I needs to be in wait fair seg of F 
that's one, change this to a two. It's not changing to a negative 33.44. All right, and here's one of the reasons comments or code smells too is because they it's not synced up. Now all of a sudden my thing that's saying, well, my bit pattern should equal. So real world example of that. Okay. Oh, this whole time, what a dork. What a dork. I think we were right on it the whole time. Two. Yeah, that's what we we're supposed to do. I want to blame that on the sun coming through the mini blinds right behind my monitor. and But really, it wasn't. I knew that I was manipulating that top number and I should have... That's another reason this comment right here was distracting me. I felt like I didn't want to touch this line. Like it was a big mystery or something. But that was just to remind us of the bit pattern. So I'll just get rid of that smelly thing. And now it's all plain and simple. F equals 2. Let's change it to F equals 3. And notice how these bit patterns are weird. Like, uh, what? So for the longest time, even when I would get it right, I would think... Uh, I think I had it wrong because I'm like, that. I obviously have the right memory, like all zeros. Okay, let's do a negative one. Okay, that first bit changed to a one. A two. Okay, a two looks like a backwards, that 10 in the other binary, the first integer way. Like, it, so that would throw me off too because I was like, oh man, I'm doing it backwards again. I would just get so caught up in a loop and I'd go change all my code back and be like, how did I think it was working the other way? But anyway, um, we've come through here. We got it working the way we expect. We can see those bits. I don't want to talk about it too much right now. I just want to talk about some of this refactoring and driving the development and stuff. So uh, it's like, when do we refactor or whatever? So I've accomplished my mission right here, that mission that I set out for right when the video started. I can get rid of this code while I'm at it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that's something a, a static linter would have found. It would have been like, oh, you've got an unused variable right here, right? So at this point, you'd want to run a linter. Like whenever you want to refactor, whenever you're in that mode, um, that would be, you know, at least run your human linter, if nothing else. So I don't... I. Like, this is as heavyweight as IDE as I prefer, honestly. Like, some syntax coloring would be nice, but uh, I don't like it with all those pop-ups. Like, if I have to constantly hit the escape key and stuff like that, then to me it's just like, I would rather just type, I could type, like, so many characters without inconveniencing myself in the space of time I have to, like, reach up and hit the escape key to just constantly pull out these random speed bumps in most IDEs, but that's just me anyway. Um, but yeah, anyway, going through here, just uh, like, if we're done, we're done, you know? If we can just come in here and just set this, like, to any value that somebody, like, oh, I want to see what 99.9 .9 looks like. Okay, there it is. That's it. You know, you can write that down or whatever. Like, our job is done. But what if somebody wants to see that with like really cool colors or something like that you know which is actually that's part of my plan um i decided to kind of break this chunk off from what was compounding with the other video that i was doing was about the single precision numbers and i uh was planning on doing this part of introducing how to like dig up the pointers and stuff on there which i still may and then just giving this really basic representation like that but then I wanted to plug in my own like display procedure that, you know, just swap it out that has like a prettier display with like colors and lines and stuff that shows what's going on with those bits and helps explain whatever numbers we we do more um, to give some insight on my thinking on that. So anyway thinking like that where it's like oh we might actually want to do something more with this code in the future that's one thing i've been digging lately is like we're do like a sort of like a three strikes or something like that to where it's like the more times you revisit something it's like okay if we're done we're done right but if i constantly keep opening this program for some reason like i'm constantly making this change like right here every time like I want to change that like 777 like what's up with that okay 
that um, that's not only more than one reason to change, but that's also something that that's that I'm doing to the code. So if I can alleviate that and just say like um, in basic, you can do that for an input. Actually, that will give me a print. It's supposed to be an input statement, but input. Um, Yeah, I could do input your number. Let's do it kind of cheesy like the old school basic stuff. And then that will become F, right? And then right there it asks for the number. So every time we run it now, I can just do 44 or whatever. Boom, there it is. So now I don't have to change the source code. So that's one little kind of like a refactor. You could argue that was like a feature add. Um, but then like right here, if if we had this function doing more stuff, or even if we just get right here and we're just revisiting this function for so many, whatever reason, say it was something more complex or whatever than this, this is just supposed to represent that, right? Um, we're looking in here and we're like, shoot, what does this line do again right here? Like what... I don't remember. It's okay. It's building up a bit string. It says bit string equals, and it's trimming a string of a byte minus byte. What is that? You know, so it's like, well, for one thing, if we just decompose the line, we know that this right here is calculating the remainder, right? So we could at this point start extracting it like that. That's what I really want to do, and if I was being really incremental from the beginning, like maybe using literally using test-driven development, then I probably might have caught that and done that. But uh, that might not be the best approach right away. Even though it's so tempting, it's like, oh, I could just put that in a remainder function, and then I could just change that part out right there to say remainder of uh, byte divided by 2. And I would pass the byte and the two, or I could say remainder two, call the function remainder two, since it's that would be kind of like maybe I think a curried function and functional program. But anyway, um, yeah, and then it would just be more short and sweet and readable, and we could stash that. We know this formula is not going to change. Like, does it wouldn't have a reason to change because you're not going to divide, you know, to uh, calculate the remainder of a binary number. You're not going to change that. But anyway, that I think serves as a good example to say, hey, even though that's so tempting and so obvious right there, there's complexity around that, right? Wrapping the function, even if you got a type like in Python, if you had to type lambda in front of that or something, that's complexity. Like an arrow function, whatever, like it's all going to be, um, anytime you wrap, the, like wrapping curly braces around something is complexity, you know? You might, I mean, yeah, it's not the biggest deal in the world, but all that stuff adds up. You know, one pair of curly braces is nothing, but that's why languages like basic Python, they don't have curly braces because they know that that's needless complexity. But the languages that give you them, you get there's trade offs for everything. Right. Um, honestly, these days, I don't I no longer really see a huge reason for curly braces. Um, they just they can help you enforce scope. They can. But so many of the patterns we use now, they just like, there's other ways of doing it that are equal or better, it seems like. But anyway, they have their reasons, and they, they help make things explicit and stuff like that, especially once you get into more of like those two types of languages, like the more declarative versus the imperative. The imperative, it looks like junk like this. You tell it every little step, like this is completely imperative right here, right? Um, but I have that control. You know, I can I can change the precedence of stuff in here. I can change that to a minus if I wanted. You know, like I have that control. Oops. Uh, with declarative on the higher level, where you would be more declarative, which is what we're going to change this to. So that's what we want to do is we want to just grab this whole chunk, grab the whole thing. Don't reach into the ooze and grab like the little eyeball whatever thing rotting out of the middle of it grab the whole mess look at what it's doing like figure out what it what is it accomplishing 
building a bit string is how it's it's build build bit string that's good enough for me right now I'm gonna be revisiting it in the immediate future um, so I can decide if that name doesn't work you know as long as I haven't published the API to the public um, or changed it in too many zillions of places then I can just do a, either a visual inspection search and replace kind of thing or I can uh, use the mechanical facilities in this fancy IDE here so we're gonna cut this and name this to build bit string and what's it gonna take in here each time it's gonna take in the variables that we just took out of here so we'll go ahead and do this for now and just do uh, new function build bit string since I had underlined it it typed it in for me um, in other languages you just go above or below the function you're in and start type in basic you can go below everything and just start typing function and will automatically kick you over to this in procedural languages like C you might I usually start like whatever main function and then build on back go back up on top of that in source code if you work your way backwards like that then they'll you won't have to prototype your functions at the beginning or whatever for you know simple little stuff okay so we're gonna paste that in here there it is so now build bit string Oh, expected statement so uh, function we got to just type in build bit string equal and that's how we return a value in here so we look at the variables we need here um, we've got byte and we've got bit string so we're gonna build bit string from byte with bit string that's kind of like a typical um, way to word things like usually if you look at it like they'll it will be this and then when you get to this bracket right here that will usually be read like of or um, from it depends on whatever sort of convention you want to use but keep that in mind and if you look at well-designed APIs and stuff look at how the parameters are being passed and how it's worded and stuff especially people who claim to be conscious about that stuff it's interesting but all you there's several conventions you know that are possible just kind of pick one and stick to it or whatever and then it reads once you know those kind of like little things like that you see build bit string um, from byte with or yeah build bit string from byte with bit string so or bit variable that doesn't really read in the head too well with the doubling of the bit string so it could be um, build string maybe that would even be shorter and sweeter build string with by uh, from byte with bit string but it is specifically a bit string and it um, if we look at the functionality of it and also it, it, it does take the bit string it's building on top of the bit string so whatever I'm just gonna call it good there but if you can think of a better name um, sh relatively shorter is a little bit better you know but not too short anyway so that brings in I was able to determine what variables need to be passed in by just looking at them and we'll just call them the same thing in here because it makes sense still that you're taking in this byte and you're breaking it down and you're converting it to that uh, the thing I forgot to do though is bring in that four with it so four and we can use the I now stick to convention since we're in our own little local scope for I equals zero to seven because there's eight bits total and then we can just do a next all right so let's go back to here so now we don't have so we don't have to do the for loop because that does have the for loop see that's that's an interesting point of a trade-off too right there because it's like well 
if I get rid of the four, then when it goes to save that byte, then it won't um, it will only save the byte once, right? But the thing is, I've obviously forgot to take that byte saving thing needs to go into that function. I forgot to grab that. So we can just take it all into the function with us. It was all contextual. I had actually just added too many spaces to make it clear, like right here, adding those little extra spaces on those lines. Okay, so we'll take that. Byte equals byte divided by two. Go back in here. And then byte equals byte integer division truncation divided by two and we've got the four in there already so that should be cool bounce back all right so uh, that can come back into build bit string it needs its byte with uh, build bit string from byte with the existing bit string okay now it should work just like it did before Type mismatch. So we're returning a string. Um, I do remember this hang up in QBasic is that you have to name your function. Um, I could just tack a string on the end, but whenever, I don't know, this is kind of one of the screwed up parts. I have to name it. If you're returning, I guess, anything besides a single precision float, you have to tack on a little qualifier on your function like that. So. But the thing is, is since I have to do that string, and in basic, I always read in my head, like when I see that dollar sign, I read string, right? Um, but when I do this F2 thing, it's just build bit. And they leave, they get rid of the string thing on there, and it's like, well, they should have left that on there because then I don't read it the same when I'm looking for it in this list. But whatever. Build bit. But if we were in Java or something, that would have been fine the way it was. We'll do two. That didn't work. Why? So bit string needs to be bit string plus equals that. Okay. So it's going to print out. It's going to start with that lowest byte. So here is where we'd want to prefix it in this scenario right here. And we got to remember this bit string is different than the one, a little bit different than the one, this is the grand bit, screen, uh, bit string out here. The one that's in there is um, in that function. This is local. So we could even just call it B string if like it's a little too close for comfort in the naming. I personally think bit strings probably better, but uh, then we know, okay, that's like the little one byte bit string. And then when we come back out here, this one is the ultimately going to be the, the uh, 32 bit bit string, right? But the little one, the little local one in the function is only going to be doing a byte at a time. Four bytes of passing byte and bit string in here. Let's go back in there. Um, doing that for each bit building it up the, is it it's saving that oh each time it's saving it is that that's wrong that's the problem right there that build bit string should be byte and then uh, out here we want to just build bit string equals Wait, that's B string is what that was supposed to be, not byte. Way out of it. Build bit string equals B string. 
Okay. Whoa. All right, too many zeros. What am I doing wrong? TMF, da, 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 da. Okay, so it looks like it's printing the right number at first, then it's printing a bunch of zeros and a bunch of zeros, then it's printing the right number, then a bunch of zeros. Something to that effect, maybe. Step through it. All right, from the top, declare an F is single, getting the number. Coming in here. Two or three, getting the byte value. So that's build bit string. Maybe I wasn't. Am I not resetting something? It's building bit string on top of bit string. We need to build that up. If we go into this function, it's taking the byte, which should be fine. We shouldn't need any address or anything. That's just like an integer value, or not an integer value, like an 8-bit value. Um, that math looks good. That gives us the remainder. All that looks good. And then it saves that in B string. By divided by two. Then build bit equals B string. So that looks good. This is where test driven development would really come in handy too, because you could test this function on its own in isolation like this. And that's kind of one of the ways test-driven development promotes pushing these things out to a function because if you want to test like is all this doing what I expect it to do you'd have to push it out to a function or you know be a lot better off to and you give it this interface you know this is considered its behavior right here you have the um, the name the variable name of the the function that you call or whatever so that should be descriptive. Um, this is its return type effectively. And then you have its parameters that it takes. So that is what is called, in, especially in object-oriented programming, that's what's called behavior. Um, it's your input and your output. You know, your input values and your output. Your expected output based on what your input values are. Some people would say contract. But um, under some of the older strict definitions of contract, there's this idea of state, and that might apply to some situations, but in this day and age, we know that state's best to be avoided, so I don't think that um, talking in terms of the contract, I like to talk in terms of the contract without bringing up the state uh, whenever possible. <clears throat> So that's L trimming, that should be working. Like, I don't see, none of those are static variables, so they shouldn't hold their value over the whole thing. I need to just delete this one. It's kind of weird you have to do it like this, but whatever. Because it saves this file as one continuous file. These aren't really broken off, like how they look like they're individual files. It's kind of the thing with QBasic. It's almost like if you do any functions or sub procedures, they're effectively like their own file in the editor.
which is kind of nice on one hand if you're used to jumping around and used to that but when I was very first programming I hated that it was like so disjointed um, can't believe I don't see what I'm doing wrong here oh okay so I'm building up this bit equals bit string inside the 0 to 3 thing so that's what's going wrong I effectively need to take that bit string Yeah, that's right, though, all right? Okay, you build the bit string, it comes back. And then that bit string gets that. I feel really dumb running it right now, but... What? How is that working? Oh, wait. How is that working? Why is my brain not getting this? Build bit string should return the the bit string of the first byte, right? So we'll do two. Um, it's returning a one byte string, right? It's taking in our current byte that just there doesn't seem like that should not build up on itself like that like it's doing bit string equals bit string plus kind of a style or whatever build bit string So that's really returning one byte. Oh, we're passing it in the current bit string. And then it's returning it. Okay, I was not seeing my logic there. Duh, okay. <sighs> so your shows the mind only sees what it wants to see sometimes. Um, Right here, I'm pa I mean, everybody else in the world has probably figured it out by now except me, but I'm passing in the bit string right here. And so it makes it, this has that, it's almost like a state change vibe. So that's one of the reasons why, I mean, not what I'm doing specifically is not, but it almost seems to overlap. One of the reasons why state change is considered bad <clears throat> And in most general high-level computing terms, state change is uh, like oh, your change like a side effect. State change would be anything outside the scope you're in. So anything outside the curly braces or the indention level or whatever. Um, well, I should say more like curly braces or function scope or whatever scope. Anything outside of that that name scope, that name spaced scope um, that you're in. That would be, you know, you're not, it, it's kind of weird if you're working with stuff out there that's like being behind a wall and controlling a crane on the other side or something. It's like, well, weird, you know, like, yeah, if there's nobody else out there in the world, then you could do that and everything will probably be fine. But, you know, otherwise that's dangerous. So. That's the way it is with state change too, because everything that's on the other side of the wall, that's on the other side of that scope, is um, it could be being manipulated by other people, or you know, in this case, people might be like other functions or methods or whatever. So that's bad to do. Um, right here, this is actually the more correct pattern in the case where you would want to do state change, is what. But um, I just wasn't paying attention to that, so that I was actually sticking to that pattern. It's just an one of those little confusions. So anyway, what I'm doing is I'm I'm passing in the bit string value and then we're building on that inside of the function. And that's going to result in this ultimately being built every time it comes back it's a little bit longer and it's overriding the entire bit string right here. But that's okay cuz right before it does, this is a um, right to left evaluation because of the quality operator right there. So it's going to pass in the so far we've built it one 
and do all that and then it's only going to overwrite this one at the very last thing before it moves down to the next line okay so that's how that's all working let's take one more look back at this and then we can see okay yeah that's how that's going shift f5 punching that two and it's working so what's going on here um just to give a quick idea with it is it's going and um that's a that exponent those eight bits right there that were the exponent value right after that sign bit they're you're capable of representing a two as a power of two right so that is what is going on <laughs> It's like, if you can represent the number as a power of 2, then you use the exponent thing. And that's why, obviously, the thing's t base 2. Um, and you go ahead and just do that. And then you use those long, last little string of zeros for whenever you can't quite get it there. So it's like, oh, well, what if we want to do a 5? So we'll do that and do a 5. And then you can see... Yeah, some of the exponent bits are manipulated, but it um, it also is doing some of the mantissa bits, the fractional part bits, which in this case it's a different fractional part than if you're thinking in base 10, you know, like very similar but a little bit different. So it will throw you off if you're thinking in those terms. But um, then it's got that extra one, that one on the far right right there, and that one, unless I'm a little bit off and... My understanding of this but which not like I said not wouldn't be the least bit surprising um, that one kicks it up that's sort of like that's that remainder kind of an idea in a different sense and it kicks it up and makes it that five so it adds wherever that power of two thing falls off that long string of zeros picks up the slack um, in its own way but anyway then you so what happens is you can represent a lot of numbers like in a small area right you can but not a huge range necessarily like if you use integers it's plus or minus two billion or if you go on signs plus or minus four billion roughly um with floating points you can do huge numbers like you know a billion's only what is that hundreds thousands millions billions that's like 10 digits or something so but with uh the precision, the floating points, oops, seek limits, uh, you know, there's like to the 38th power, the 45th, oh man, so I think these are, um, it's been a minute since I studied what these precision things were. So E, I can't even remember. <laughs> and I don't even care that I can't remember. But I will study it and remember it and grind it into myself until I can bring it up in a totally unrelated conversation. Um... They hold a lot of zeros. I'm going to put it at that. Like, you can hold a ton of zeros. But the thing is, is the more zeros you want to hold in either direction, too. You know, you're not limited to just a few billion. And you can go in either direction, like point zero 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 or a zillion point oh one or something. And, uh, sorry, I, this is reminding me that I do need to prepare more. But anyway... That's that, and you lose precision at the end of those huge spectrums because it can't precisely, if you think about this system, you know, you're going to run out of the amount of possibilities you can do. Like, you can do so many exponents of 2, and you can do so many fill in the remainder part with the uh, that fractional part. But once you get to the end... <sighs> All right since I brought it up I'm just gonna freaking do it don't save that go back in there and then I'm gonna let you off the hook if you've hung around this long um, so a single precision number is gonna be 
s equals well it will be zero by default just keep it simple um say while so single precision number can go up to 16 million Seven hundred and seventy-seven thousand two hundred and sixteen, right? So we're going to start at two hundred and ten, and we're going to say while s plus one is not equal to, and that's how you do not equal to in other languages, probably that, but um, not equal to. S, then go S equals S plus 1. Oh, I was typing this in like the wrong language. Okay, so it would be while that, do that, and then end that. Okay, so the trick here, the reason I was like, as long as s plus one is not equal to s that might sound crazy at first and it did to me the first time i heard it too um what it is is that as soon as you lose that precision it starts counting by twos so if you add one to the number you were just at it will just drop back down it will round back down or however you want to think about it or however it does implement it i should say um it will drop back down and it will do the same number again so when it calculates s plus 1, when it's at that limit, s plus 1 will just equal, you'll have to do s plus 2 to get the next number. Um, because it can't represent it in that notation once it's bigger than 65,215 or 16. I think it's 216 values and then maybe 0 through 215. Let's see right now. So. What we're going to do is, as long as it can do that, we're going to print it. Print S. Okay. So I'm going to do Control uh, Scroll Lock DOS box to break out of it. And uh, so what happened here? Wall S. S plus one is not equal to s print s s equals s plus one maybe i have to make sure this is single precision hmm Okay, so now look what it's done. I must have gone over the limit, maybe. Oh, in Q Basic, it won't represent certain numbers. Anything over like seven nines or something like that. How did I get it to do this last time? Okay, if s plus 1 is not greater than, because that's not equal to, so we'll say do until, and then we'll come down here and make this say loop, do until s plus 1 Tool S. This is one of the things where like you run into like a syntax thing where it's like I'm used to doing this in a different language anyway, but I should just cut all this crap out. 